When I was just about to turn 13, I heard about a game my friend had recently discovered. He and his other friend told me about it on the phone as if it was a revelation. And a few days later, on this carpet from someone who was two years my elder, I learned to play Magic the Gathering for the first time. That was seven and a half years ago. And after one keeps something so vast, so close to them for so long, a story tends to form around the time they spent with it. And my story with Magic just so happens to line up with that of the hero's journey. The first time I played Magic was also the first time I played a board game with any strategic elements in it at all. So my first few shuffles were as full of awe and danger as walking around in a magical world in itself might have been. First games of Magic are punctuated with moments of paralyzing fear at cards that, frankly, don't deserve them. New heroes gawk at numbers that are slightly larger than they can deal with, or they read cards that don't do much six times over in fear, and they react in misery to any small change to their lineup of pitifully inefficient creatures. But when a hero starts their journey, they don't realize they're making mountains of molehills and molehills of mountains. They see that the feeling of awe, wonder, and curiosity magic instills is still, 25 years later, one that an incredible amount of board games fail to reach, and it infects them. They can't stop playing, and I couldn't either. I wanted to master magic, and thankfully, there was a metaphorical coliseum of a local game store opening up in my tiny town so that I could do just that. The first time I went there, I saw a burgeoning card selection that looked something like this, give or take a few years. It wasn't that much, but to a trainee of a planeswalker, each packet contained an unexplored world that would need to be mapped out, card by card. It made me excited like nothing else. So I dove in. I drafted some cards at the first turn and run by the little card shop that could. I was extremely nervous. And I had no idea what I was doing. But somehow, out of six players, I placed third. And I earned a booster pack for my trouble. It was enough to keep me coming back. Eventually, the store ran tournaments built around pre-built decks, so I slapped together a stack of cards loosely surrounding angels for the occasion. I got stomped. I, more foolishly than wisely, decided I needed some more cards. Someone at the store interested in trading owned a whopper of an angel called Geist of St. Traft, which, to me, looked like the inside of Pulp Fiction's suitcase. I knew I needed this card immediately, so I unknowingly asked for the most unbalanced trade of my magic career. I don't think that person expected to inadvertently tutor me in the game over the course of six years when he turned me down and walked away. But that's what he did. I started trading away most of my collection to hunt down the ghost cleric that haunted my dreams. I looked online and found a prominent deck archetype with him in it and started following it to the letter. I took that construction site of a deck to more tournaments and I kept losing with it. That mentor I mentioned actually ended up being more of a rival. Whenever we matched up, he would decisively trounce me, but Every time we did, I walked away with just a little bit more information about the game, until eventually, I actually started to beat him. And then, between the creeping completion of my deck and my blossoming game sense, I started to win tournaments. But it came at a price. I think it started when I knew what my deck wanted to be before I put any cards in it. When I knew what my opponent and I wanted to do before any cards hit the table, I had stopped exploring. The magical worlds that I had loved to frolic around in had undergone an industrial revolution and they had become dystopian in the process. I really wasn't having fun playing magic anymore. I had gotten just what I wanted. It cost me everything. In order to have fun of the game I had already spent thousands of dollars of my parents' money on, I decided I was going to make up a deck as I went along. There was a card called Biovisionary in the most recently released set at the time whose alternate win condition absolutely fascinated me. 
So I built an extremely silly combo deck surrounding it. I took that deck to my LGS and I lost just about every time I played it, but I had a lot of fun doing it. I was misguided when I thought mastering magic was what made the game fun for me. What I really love about magic is everything silly about it. When I was learning the game, I loved feeling astonished at every little thing. And now that I knew the game like breathing, I loved doing those little things to other people because it meant that I could see that early astonishment in their eyes. So I weaned away from competitive magic, which led me to discover Commander, or EDH, short for Elder Dragon Highlander. It's a format played with three or more players and decks that are a little bit large, to put it lightly. I had played Commander before in my magic career, but I had only built decks that were focused around winning, which weren't fun for me to play or for the table to play against. One day, I came to the EDH table with a perfect idea and an open mind. I had constructed a deck that was entirely built to produce chaos. Eventually, I made it so no player had control over the cards they played or the other players they attacked. I had effectively turned Magic, a complex, deep strategic card game, into a luck-based slugfest. And I loved it. It made me realize I love EDH, because EDH, by its grandiose, chaotic nature, can't be solved. Commander is the only format I have a deck built for anymore. At the end of my magic journey, I'm chasing the exact same feelings I chased at the start, and I'm using the exact same caliber of deck to do it with. I just know a little bit more now than I did then. Here's the thing. Whenever I finish a game of Commander, I'm almost never happy I started. Games of EDH are random, tiringly long, and slower than if Solid Snake was a slug, but every time someone asks me if they want to play EDH with me, I jump at the opportunity. Because every single time I shuffle one of these giant stacks of cards, I'm teleported back to my friend's house learning about a silly little card game I hadn't thought much of for the first time. I wouldn't trade that feeling for the world.